Good morning. Welcome to the Village Church Sabbath School. This morning we're here to continue on in our discussion of our Sabbath School lessons that are in our quarterly, this quarter entitled Education. And the title of this week's lesson is More Lessons from the Master Teacher. It's like a part two from last week. Joining me on the panel are Dr. Jonathan Duncan and his wife, Daphne. Jonathan is the chair of the computer science and the math departments both at Walla Walla University. And his wife, Daphne, also teaches in the area of math. She teaches pre-algebra at Rogers Elementary School. And together, they uh, serve here at the church in the area of children's ministries, and they're actively involved, and we're happy to have them on our panel. Also joining us is Dr. Jody Washburn, who teaches Old Testament at Walla Walla University. Her husband also serves here at the church as our outreach coordinator, and we're happy to have Jody here with us today. My name is Steve Wallaconis. I serve as one of the pastors here at the Village Church. Before we begin our panel discussion, we will see a mission spotlight entitled The Well of Grace. And it's all about a man named Jack who met Jesus for the first time through his school principal. And as he grew up years later, he has never forgotten the experience he had there at the school, and he, now he wants to share Jesus with others as well. Uh, before we continue, let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your presence with us today. We thank you for your goodness and your love and your mercy. And we pray that you'll be with us at this hour as we study together in the Sabbath School lesson. In Jesus' name, amen. I never grew up a Christian. I never wanted anything to do with God. I was an atheist, in fact. But since meeting Jesus, I can't help but want to share Jesus with this town. Kempsey Adventist School is like a community in a nutshell. And we saw the opportunity for evangelism in this school. So we, we planted a church in the, in the school and we call it the well. What really works for the well is that we're using the existing relational stream that we offer to the community. We started off with a Friday night service. The kids actually brings the parents. And when the kids are enthusiastic and when they want to come, you know, the, the parents can't deny because um, it's a service that offers great values. Daniel is one of the fathers who come to the well on Friday nights, and he's a regular attendee. His little boy, he was making some noise, and he was crying, and he quickly, you know, got the boy outside. Our school evangelist, um, John Boston, he chased him out. He said, hey, is everything all right? And Daniel's response was, oh, I didn't want to um, make any noise. But John Boston told Daniel, no, kids are welcome. Just come on in. Daniel was uh, just so impressed by that, saying that, um, you know, I'm, I only wish that all churches were, were like this. Since Friday night service is children focused, um, we thought that there's a need to encourage the parents to invite them to another level of spiritual journey. So we started the Well Connected on Sabbath mornings, and it's a very simple format. We get together and have a chat for 30 minutes or so, and then we encourage them to, to follow through the Discovery Bible reading. 
So Discovery Bible reading, uh, I feel, is, is a great approach to, to reading the Bible. And it doesn't matter what walk of life you're from, I, I feel that because you're reading the, the Word together for the first time and then summarising it, discussing it, talking about it, I think someone who's a long-time Christian can contribute to the conversation. Someone who's completely new and inquiring, looking into Christianity, can also participate and contribute to the conversation as well. And, I've really seen, yeah, lots of growth uh, in other people, but I've also experienced it for myself. For me, the first time I met Jesus was actually through my school principal. After being suspended many times, kicked out of schools in Kempsey, my school principal, he called me into his office and I was expecting to be in front of this panel of discipline committee but he explained to me that he'd been on the phone pleading for me to stay at this school. He said, Jack, do you know what grace is? And I had no idea. <laughs> and he said to me, Jack, it's something you don't deserve, but I'm giving it to you anyways. And it was at that moment in the eyes of my teary principal that I met Jesus for the very first time. I've never forgotten that I met Jesus through someone else. That's what the well is all about. We, we come together, we eat together, we read God's word together, we love one another. And I believe with all my heart, just as I met Jesus through the eyes of my principal, that people's lives will be transformed because they are experiencing Jesus too. Our lesson today addresses a problem that we sinners all deal with, and that is the problem of shame. The shame that comes from sin. Regardless of our differences, there is one thing we all have in common as humans, and that is our general sinfulness and uh, the feeling that comes from that, our feeling of shame, and, and our, um, uh, the pain that goes with that. Many times in our lives we feel this sense of shame, our unworthiness that rises within as we recall things from our lives, things from our past, Probably, probably about every day we might have a moment or so that, that it kind of rises up. Well, our lesson today is, is a discussion about how Jesus approached people with this shamefulness. This shame results in a gap between us and God. It, it produces a separation and uh, Many times we sinners want are shy of God. In fact, we try to hide from Him and try to cover our shame. Just think how Adam and Eve must have felt in the, in the day or so after they fell into sin. Just imagine how they felt, how they didn't want to see God face to face. That's why they hid. Jacob had to go on the run after he tricked his own father, you know, over that birthright. And he and his mother kind of schemed this up together. But in the aftermath, Jacob ran away. Well, how did God deal with him? That's in our lesson today. Imagine also the humiliation that was felt by this by the woman that was caught in adultery. Can you imagine her shame 
to be made a public spectacle. And then Jesus, you know, was center to that episode, that story. And we learn a lot about how God deals with sinners who are overwhelmed with their shame. David, too, the psalmist, must have had quite a bit of shame, as we know his story. And, in fact, he penned Psalm 32, which is sort of a little testimony of how he processed his shame, the result of his shame, and how he overcame it and had found grace in God. So our lesson today is, is lesson, more lessons from the master teacher. And I, I, I appreciated this lesson because it emphasized God's approach to sinners and how he tried to reconcile what had been broken. You know, we may have friends or acquaintances who are ashamed sometimes. Maybe there's some, something happened in our, between us uh, years ago and someone might be embarrassed, you know. I can think of some in my life. Uh, there, are, there are breaks in relationships between friends, you know, something awkward happened and now people are, are embarrassed and they're ashamed and, and there's this break, this gulf, this gap and, and many times I find myself wanting to heal that, you know, let's, let's continue on, let's, let's move ahead and let's just forget, you know, what happened. Well, you know, I can see God also trying to get us together with himself. And that's what our lesson today is, is, is largely about. So let's go into our quarterly and let's go into the Bible. And the first part of the lesson is entitled, Instead of Hiding. And it, it focuses on the, on the garden, Adam and Eve, how they, uh, how they had fallen. And let's, let's turn in our Bibles and just read a little bit. And then we can uh, see what lessons we learn about how God deals with sinners. So let's turn to Genesis 3 and read those verses 7 through 13. Uh, why don't we start right here, Jody? Can you read those verses? Sure. Verse 7 begins, Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me. And I ate. Okay. So the point of this paragraph is that they went into hiding. They sinned. They disobeyed God's command. And it just, they didn't know what God would do. What would God do with them? They disobeyed. They, they violated his command. They, they, uh, they partook of this fruit that God said, do not eat. They sinned. What? They didn't know what God was going to do, did they? Was God going to just destroy them? Was he going to just burn them? What was he going to do? They had no idea, did they? Was he just going to, to just just take away their life and, or uncreate them or what was he going to do? They had no idea. So they went into hiding. 
Now, do we know what time of day this took place when they sinned? It does mention the cool of the day, the Lord God walking in the cool of the day. Um, what does that mean? The, he, he came in the cool of the day. Does that... They must have sinned, of course, earlier in the day. So God didn't destroy them immediately. They probably feared, oh no, when God sees us, we're dead. There must have been a little time because he comes at the, well, we assume it's the end of the day. Does that tell us something, anything about God? The fact that he didn't destroy them immediately? Apparently, he showed up later in the day. Uh, the cool of the day. Do you think that tells us something about the patience of God with us? I know as a, as a parent, there are times when one of my children does something and one of my strategies is to wait mm -hmm. to talk with them about mm -hmm. it and to talk about consequences and so on. Now, I have to admit, part of that is a very human thing that I know if I am more collected and, and have gathered myself, I'm going to be more patient with them and express myself better. I, I don't think God had to worry about that. But part of it is also that I want them to think about it and process it and not react as kind of a knee-jerk, well, I didn't do it or I did it because, kind of like because the, uh, the woman you gave me or because the serpent made me do it. So I wonder if God was giving them time to process and to be ready for that conversation. Okay. So God gave them a little time. You know, we all can think of someone we know that may be really quick-tempered, hot-tempered, you know, and they react immediately if they're provoked. Is God that way? He must not be. This is the first episode we have of a sinner in the Bible and the first example of how God relates to it. So he's not showing himself to be a hot-headed, temperamental, angry God. There must have been a little time, as Jonathan said, where he's allowing them to Think about it, ponder it, and then he's going to talk to them. Let's say a little more about the cool of the day. Yeah, uh, we just came off of kind of a hot summer, and we can picture what the cool of the day is like. What, what, what do you do in the cool of the day at your house? Um, do you kind of unwind a little bit? Do you... You know, you kind of relax a little bit. It's a time to reflect. Uh, it's a together time. Together. Mm -hmm. Together with? With family. Family. Friends. Okay. Go to the park. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's just a more relaxed time, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I, wonder, I wonder if God comes to us, especially in those times when we are in a quieter frame of mind. You know, we might be on a walk. Uh, we might be alone on a canoe. Uh, we might be just out in the garden. You know, it's a, it's a quieter time, isn't it, of the day, the cool of the day. Do you think the Holy Spirit talks to us most effectively during that kind of a time when we're more relaxed, uh, hmm. more meditative maybe, uh, unwinding. I think it's easier for us to listen to the Holy Spirit at that time of day because okay. during the day, you know, I've got laundry and I've got lesson plans and I've got, you know, this, this, this. Yeah. But when I can kind of just sit 
and let my mind relax, then yeah, the Holy Spirit is more able to talk. I wonder if the, if the um, you know, the writer, whoever decided exactly what elements to weave into this narrative wanted those connotations too, because in, in Hebrew, the word is like ruach. So we translate it the cool of the day because we imagine like what, what time of the day, when, when in the day do you have this like... Is that kind of like the wind? Doesn't yeah, ruach mean wind, like wind? breath. Breath. But it's also, you know, the connotation that God breathed the ruach, you oh. know, into us. Huh. It's, the, huh. it's the imagery breath for, yeah, breath of life for, hmm. for some of that movement. So hmm. I wonder if the, huh. if the writer wanted those connotations that you're mentioning, huh. you know, that using these words hmm. that had layers of meaning. My, mm -hmm. yes. So there was going to be a, a, a meaningful interaction mm -hmm. coming in the cool of the day. Um, so that, I think, speaks of the patience of God with the sinner. He's not an explosive God. He, rather, he's coming in a gentle way. It says he's, did it say he's walking? They heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. What picture does that show of God? He wasn't coming with a stick after them, was he? <laughs> he was just gracefully He didn't appear right in front of them wherever they were hiding either, as he could have. Yeah. So he was wanting them to, okay. to seek him out All right. as well. Mm -hmm. Let's go now to, the, to the, um, the questions that he was asking. And in the verses we read, or that Jody read, <clears throat> I noticed there are four questions. Now, you're, you're all teachers. And uh, what is the role? Do you ever use questions in your teaching methods? What is, the, what is the role of questions when you're going to teach something important? How does it work? You want to get them thinking about maybe <laughs> what they have already know mm -hmm. and how that's going to relate to what we're going to be doing. Okay, so questions start thinking. Yeah. I see God, <clears throat> I see God asking questions and I think he's, uh, you know, like I say, this is his first, this is the first interaction between God and the sinner. Um, the first question he asked is, where are you? The Lord said to Adam, where are you? Now, didn't God know where they were? Were they, were they hiding so well he couldn't find them? <laughs> it, it was God just, was it hide and seek? <laughs> <laughs> where are you? Where was Adam and Eve? Where were they? Well, they must have been somewhere behind something, trees or bushes or mm -hmm. something. And God called to them. Where are you? It's a good open-ended question. Mm -hmm. No, no leading, not leading into a certain answer, but, yeah. but open-ended. Yeah. You know, um, let me digress for just a half a moment here. In the church, the preacher preaches sermons, and the people listen to sermons. And uh, there may be times when the preacher is making a really strong point, and uh, someone in the, in the congregation is hearing it and thinking, you know, that really applies to brother so-and-so. Or, uh, I hope sister so-and-so heard that, you know. They, they divert the, the message to someone else, you know. Apply it to someone else. 
<clears throat> but when God came to Adam, he was pretty direct, wasn't he? He said, Adam, where are you? <laughs> you. When God comes to a sinner, uh, we stand before him individually and he talks to us one-on-one -on -one and asks us to think, where are you? Where are you? And when he's looking at us that way, seriously looking, you know, we can't divert it. We can't, we can't pivot it to someone else, can we? Because God is looking, he's looking right at Adam. Where are you? So God is dealing with him personally, carefully. And then uh, the, con the questioning goes on. Verse 10, I heard your voice, Adam said. I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And then God said, here's question number two. Who told you that you were naked? Did Adam have to be told he was naked? What, is, what was his nakedness, by the way? I mean, God made him, he, he and Eve. Uh, they were uninhibited in front of each other. But then after they sinned, what was this feeling, this awkwardness they now felt? I think it was shame. Hit the shame. Yeah, that shame. The shame. Of knowing they had done something wrong. Yeah. And now they're not looking at each other as created beings by God, but they're looking at themselves yeah. and what they've done. And, mm -hmm. and God said, who told you you were naked? You know, nobody has to tell us to feel ashamed. No one has to say, well, who told you you're ashamed? You know, it's, it's, a, it's a consequence of our, our shame. It's a, it's a consequence of our sin that, that we feel. Um, and, it's, and nakedness is something we want to cover, isn't it? Our shame is something we want to cover and hide. And so Adam must have felt very exposed in front of God and wanted to be covered. Hmm. Then he goes to question number three, verse 11. Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? I mean, there's a direct... Uh, question to get an answer. And you know, when we are before God, doesn't he want us to acknowledge our sin and admit that we are sinners, that we have done something, that we are guilty? You know? There's, there's, there's a, a total openness here that God is asking of us. Well then, verse 12, the man said, well, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. So what do we see there? <laughs> Another the blame see, game. We see, <laughs> pardon? The blame game. The blame. Yeah, and we see kind of a natural response to um, conviction you know, to divert it, blame someone else, someone else's fault. Maybe and then they verse, say, pardon? They say confession is good for the soul, and yeah. so there's something about yeah. admitting verbally to somebody that you committed that wrong. Yes. Yeah. Now, all the way through this, what, what sort of God do we see? 
what are we learning about God through the way he's handling Adam and then Eve? Relational, he's taking relational. initiative, asking questions. Okay. He's not being confrontational, but he's also not prevaricating or ignoring the issue. Not ignoring, being yeah. direct. Mm -hmm. They were wondering how, what is going to happen when God shows up? Are we going to be incinerated or what? What is God going to do with us? They knew he was going to come, but we're learning how he came. Now we're learning how he came. Then verse 13, the Lord speaks to Eve, and he asks her a question. This is question number four now in the garden. What is this you have done? What does that question uh, pro provoke or prompt? What is that meant to prompt a question that direct? Maybe personal responsibility? Okay. Or a confession. Mm -hmm. What is this you have done? Did you ever ask that to your children? Is that a question a parent would ask to a child when uh, there's been a an episode, you know? Get the child to express what has just happened. It's not just a yes-no question. It's also kind of an invitation for some explanation. An explanation, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. to just elaborate a little bit. <clears throat> well, what was Eve's response? She said, well, she said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. She, too, had a little bit of this blame game going, mm -hmm. but then she confessed, I ate. I just kind of appreciate how God handled them. He didn't come in anger, did he? Do we see the anger? Any anger? Is there any wrath here? Do you see it? But he kind of led them through a little process here to ha cause them to examine themselves, to talk about it. And all this happened in the cool of the day when God can talk to someone in, um, in an open, gentle way. And then after he gets through this, you know what? What does God have for them? Does he have vengeance, wrath, anger? Is there hope for them? Is there hope? I notice that after God gets through and gets a confession finally, Actually, Eve confessed, and she said, I ate. You know, it was at that point when uh, God spoke of a promise. In Genesis 3, 15, there's a promise. He cursed the serpent, and he said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, a capital S, her seed, he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. There's some new information for them. A descendant, some, someone in their family line would deal with the serpent. And then I notice God provided covering, didn't he? He provided covering. And it was a tunic of some kind, tunics of skin. So we assume a, a lamb, 
An animal was sacrificed, likely a lamb, and they were covered. You know, I see a little microcosm of, of salvation there. God dealing with a sinner. And once they admitted, God had grace. And God provided a covering. And doesn't he cover us today? Does he deal with us in a similar way? Where are you? He comes to each of us today and asks that question. Where are you? He's looking for us, isn't he? Mm -hmm. This is a God of grace. He has grace to give us, and he's looking for us. And where are we? Many times hiding. We're afraid of him. We're ashamed in front of him. And we want to cover but he comes to us and he graciously provides hope and a covering. And the covering for us is Christ, the Lamb of God. You know, are there other stories in the Bible about hiding? Can you think of any other stories? We've kind of gone through this pretty thoroughly, but are there other characters in the Bible who were running from God? Can you think of any? And God had to run after them? <laughs> I think the obvious one is Jonah. Jonah, that's it. <laughs> Jonah's the one that kids learn first about hiding from God. He was hiding, wasn't he? He ran away. God had <laughs> called him to a mission and and uh, Jonah ran the opposite direction, didn't he? Running, thinking he could escape. Mm -hmm. Well, God, had, God dealt with him graciously too, didn't he? Yeah. Even though he was thrown overboard, God rescued him and sent him in the right direction. And, uh, and then the way God dealt with Nineveh was pretty gracious too, wasn't it? Any that, other stories? Well, I was just going to say that, that story of Jonah, the way you see it in the, in the Bible, also is designed to apply directly to us. Yeah. So the book ends hanging as if, what would you do if you were in <laughs> Jonah's position and God had just graciously, you know, extended all of this mercy yeah. to these people who you have just you know, described as okay. just horribly wicked and yeah. you're going down. Yeah. Um, okay. And so it ends with that question. And I feel like these other stories, you know, Genesis too, mm. it, it kind of leaves the question in our hand. Yeah. Do you choose blame, to hide behind blame? Mm -hmm. Or do you choose to kind of respond, like turn toward God when he mm -hmm. um, initiates relationship, when he reaches out? Does God's grace surprise us? You know, we as humans, uh, referring to Jonah again, you know, he was, uh, he was kind of eager for, for Nineveh to be burned up, wasn't he? Because they were so wicked. I mean, they deserve to be destroyed. But in the story, lo and behold, they responded to the invitation of mercy and God spared them. And Jonah was a little bit surprised. <laughs> they didn't, weren't getting what they truly deserved. That's another lesson of, from the master teacher, God, mm -hmm. that he's not like us. You know? We, we are more hot-tempered. We have more episodes of wrath. We cry for vengeance. And he surprises us, doesn't he, with uh, grace. Um, there was another uh, example I was thinking of, and that is Cain. You remember Cain, when he, after he killed Abel, he too went on the run, didn't he? And, you know, Cain was the murderer. 
Uh, in chapter 4, Cain murdered Abel, and uh, then he went on the run. And how did God deal with Cain? With a question, what have you done? Where do you see that? Oh, he starts with it. That's not the first question. I was oh. looking in verse 10. Okay. Starts even earlier. Where okay. is your brother? Okay. He goes, to, he goes after Cain with questions again, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. What have you done? Where is Abel, your brother? <laughs> and I tell you, God wants us to, to, to pause and think about what we've done, doesn't he? But how did he treat Cain? Did he, did he burn him up right on the spot? You know, when I look at verse 15, I see God even gracious to Cain. The Lord said to him, Whoever kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And so the Lord set a mark on Cain, lest anyone finding him should kill him. So there's God protecting Cain. Isn't that something? And Cain had murdered a brother. And even at that, God gave grace and protection. When we go into Romans, we have a little bit of a reference back to this episode in, Dan, in, uh, in Genesis. When we turn to Romans chapter 5, we can learn about God's plan to rescue us from the results of what Adam had done. I'm turning to Romans 5, and uh, let's read there uh, verses 15 through 19. And, uh, and this, this harkens back to, to Adam and, and his sin, and then what God has done to, to, to address it. So, Jonathan, can you read those verses, 15 through 19? Certainly. But the free gift is not like the offense. For if by one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For the judgment which came from the, the one offense resulted in condemnation. But the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as through one man's offense judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so through one man's righteous act the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. All right, so one man got us into the trouble. One man got us under condemnation, Adam. But God didn't just leave us there, did he? How did he counteract it? What did he do about it? It tells us he sent Jesus. And through one man's sin, judgment came, condemnation came. You know, we didn't have much hope <clears throat> until Jesus came. And so we learn again about God that he doesn't leave us alone. He doesn't forsake us, does he? Through one man, terrible tragedy occurred in this world, but then through another man, Jesus, hope and a gift and righteousness came. <clears throat> it's wonderful God just doesn't ignore us, does he? He came after Adam in the garden, and now he's still coming after us. He came in Jesus after us, toward us. 
What a gracious God he is. Well, there's another story in the Bible about someone who ran, <clears throat> ran away, and that's uh, Jacob. So we're going to go now to Genesis 28. Uh, Genesis 28, back to Genesis again. 28, another story <clears throat> of someone on the run, and then God comes to him. And let's talk about what we might learn here. Genesis 28, let's just read uh, those verses from 10, verse 10 through 17. Uh, Daphne, could you read, please? Sure. Jacob left Beersheba and went towards Haran. And he came to a certain place and stayed there that night, because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, there was a ladder set up on earth, and the top reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you, and I will keep you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I promised you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So Jacob is uh, on the run. And, and why is he running? What happened? What happened to him? What's he running from? I think it's interesting. Um, when we were discussing the story of Adam and Eve, you mentioned they were running maybe because they didn't know what God was going to do. They were ashamed, certainly, but they were also scared, but they didn't know what would happen. Yeah. I think Jacob had a little more uh, solid threat that he was running from. You know, it was pretty clear what his brother wanted to do to him. All right. So. And what had he done that ang would anger his brother so much? <laughs> Deception. There was deception. Theft, one could say. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, outright. Mm -hmm. uh, blatant fraud, I guess, you know, to def mm -hmm. defraud a brother. Now, on his run, he's running away, and uh, he stops, and it's nighttime. He falls asleep, his head on a pillow, and he sees a dream of a, of a ladder. You know, we call it Jacob's ladder. It's just a Jacob's dream of a ladder. But what did, it, what would this, what did this ladder represent to him? What, what might it mean? Like a portal between heaven and earth. That, that there was a, um, a connection between heaven and earth. Now, he could have felt, you know, I've really, I've really blown it. I've, I've done something so bad. You know, I've ruined this whole covenant idea and, and uh, uh, broken this, the, the birthright system. And God sir, surely would throw me out. You know, I deserve to be thrown out. Well, that's probably another reason he was afraid and running. <clears throat> but God assured him, didn't he? God came not only with that vision of a ladder that uh, showed him there's a connection between heaven and earth, but also promised, verse 15, I am with you. I will not leave you until, what I, have, until I have done what I have spoken to you. Here again is, is God not running away, and he's not hiding. 
You know, we could say we sinners are prone to hide from God, <clears throat> but some might fear, well, God is hiding from us. God has abandoned us. You know, I think one of the worst pains in this world is when someone has a sense of abandonment. You know, some, some young people feel abandoned from their parents, by their parents. And what could be worse than if we had been abandoned by God because we're sinners? We've done bad. But the story of Jacob, doesn't it show that uh, we don't need to hide from this kind of God? Can you think of any other stories where someone was hiding or running? And because of their shame, they, they went into the backgrounds. What about the story of Peter? Uh, was he ashamed? Mm -hmm. And how did Jesus reinstate him? How did, how did Jesus put him back? and restore him. Commissioned him. Included him. Included him yeah. back. Mm -hmm. Okay. Tell the disciples and Peter, you know, include Peter in this wonderful message of the resurrection. Mm -hmm. um, how about Luke 15? Uh, the, story, the, the chapter that has the parables, you know, the, the prodigal son, the lost coin, the lost sheep. Um, it starts out at the beginning of that chapter with Jesus sitting with sinners and, you know, eating with them. Um, that tells us, you know, God is not hiding from us. God is not avoiding us, but rather he's right there with us, isn't he? So we see it in the story of Jacob, we see it in Peter's experience, and certainly during the gospel uh, stories of Christ's life. Um, let's go to the book of John, and uh, and just review again those verses that remind us of God's presence his initiative, uh, his coming down to us. Let's read verses 1 through 5. Let's start there and just remind ourselves that uh, Jesus is not avoiding us or uh, uh, hiding from us, but is initiating his presence with us. Jody, could you read verses 1 through 5? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. Mm -hmm. Can you read verse 14 as well? The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Mm -hmm. Came from the Father, full of grace. See, this is not a God who is out to get us. He's out to find us and to bridge that gap mm -hmm. or that gulf between us. We're the ones hiding. We're the ones running. We're the ones who are ashamed. But he came with grace. He surprises us by accepting us and reinstating us and covering us. Let's read verse uh, 29. Verse 29. Uh, Jody, please, more. Okay. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, 
Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Okay, what does he do with our sin? Takes it away. Takes it away. <clears throat> and John referred to him as the Lamb. The Lamb. How many lambs had been slain through the centuries of Judaism? You know, how many thousands of lambs? And then Jesus comes and he's called the, the lamb. Takes away the sins of the world. Um, you know, we could, uh, we could just go on and on like this, but our time is closing. Is there one big thing that the master teacher has taught us today? One big thing that we could just say, this is what we've learned here today. What would it be? I think for me, I notice a thread in all the stories that no matter what shame or uncertainty or fear that you're facing, every narrative points back to the idea that this is not the end of the story. God initiates and then shows you forward, uh -huh. you know, on the onward journey. Good. That's right. He comes down to where we are, meets us in our situation, and leads us forward. Anything else? I think to me it points out one of the unique aspects of Christianity as opposed to other religions where in many other religions it's up to the person to seek out God, to better themselves to the point where they can commune with God. And, and in Christianity it's exactly the opposite. God comes down to us and it doesn't matter what your answer to the question, where are you, is. God is going to be there ready to help you. He's going to find us. Well, thank you all for sharing today. This has been a good study. Uh, we're going to close now with prayer and thank God for his love and grace to us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this time of study. We thank you for being a loving God. And as we study the scriptures, we see over and over again your initiative toward us, your love and grace that has been manifest and how you cover us and cover our shame and reinstate us into your family for all eternity. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.